It's a real treat for me to introduce Yiling Chen, who is a professor at Harvard. She is one of the young stars who works at the boundary of game theory, economics, and computer science. And she will tell us about prediction markets. Thanks a lot, Anna. Uh, thanks for having me. I'm going to talk about how can we design markets for the purpose of getting probabilistic information from a diverse group of people and eventually to make an informed prediction. So let me start with something seemingly irrelevant. So I'd like to talk about concentrated orange juice. Um, so concentrated orange juice is the number one juice that US consumers uh, drink. And as it's concentrated and it's made from oranges, so of course the manufacturer of orange juice cares about the production of oranges. And oranges has a property. So orange trees, almost all orange trees that are used to produce concentrated orange juice are grow in central Florida. And orange trees are very sensitive to temperatures. So even if the temperature dropped below freezing, just about a few hours, those trees could die. And it took five to 10 years to grow the orange trees. And they could die in a few hours if the lowest temperature dropped below freezing. So what it means is that they're very sensitive to temperatures and manufacturers uh, of orange juices, they care about the production of oranges, so they want to hedge their risk. So there are orange futures contract. So the orange futures contract treats something looks like this. So they trace a certain amount of orange juice solid and a specified future date, meaning that if I'm buying this contract, this futures contract, it will entitle me to purchase this amount of orange juice solid in April. Okay. And as I mentioned that, um, orange trees are very sensitive to temperature. So you can imagine that the prices of this contract is highly correlated with the temperature of Florida. And in fact, researchers have looked into that. They looked into improving the weather forecast using the prices from this future contract. And they show that that can be successfully done. So the reason that I'm giving this example is because it kind of saying that markets has the ability to aggregate information. In this particular case, the relevant information to this contract, including the temperature of uh, the weather, so the temperature, so that information is reflected into the market price for this contract. So here's another example. So why we want to use market. So if you ever rem uh, remember that uh, the HP researchers proof of N not equal to NP, so just came out, um, as someone who didn't work in computer science theory, I'm clueless about how likely that proof is going to be correct or not. If you ask me whether that proof is correct or not, I probably would just give you an uninformed guess. But then if you read Scott Arison's blog, so Scott Arison is a um, professor in theoretical computer science at MIT. So this is what he wrote, basically saying that if that proof is correct, I would personally supplement the price by an amount of $200,000. And he's further saying that, well, by saying that, I basically have a way to state my opinion that no one else can argue with me because I basically bet my house on it. So the message I'm trying to give here is that betting allows people to express credible opinions. So after reading this, I'm sure that almost everyone in the room probably is thinking about the probability for this proof to be correct is not that high. At least the one expert in the area seems to be not thinking that the proof is correct. Okay. And that's where the idea of a prediction market comes into play. A prediction market basically is a betting intermediary that allowing people to wagering their money uh, on the opinions related to the event of interest. So here is a contract that I took from an online prediction market called Intrade. So in this particular contract, um, the contract basically trying to predict whether the movie Argo is going to win 
uh, Academy Award for Best Picture. And this contract will pay off $10 if Argo did win and $0 otherwise. So it's either $10 or $0. And the current price of the contract is about $2.50, so it's here. So if I'm a trader in the market and look at this contract, I should think about, okay, I have a belief for how likely Argo is going to win. And if my belief is P, I should buy the contract if, uh, I should buy this security at any price less than 10 times P, because that is the expected value of this contract evaluated at my belief. And if the current price is lower than this, then in expectation, I'm going to make money. And I'm willing to sell the security at any price greater than 10 times P. Because again, in expectation, I'm going to make money. So if everyone is doing this, in some sense, we can think about the market price reflects the collective intelligence regarding to how likely that this event is going to happen. So we do have a mapping here. So we can think about that the, the prices of the contract can be mapped to the probability of how likely the event is going to happen. And the current price measures the population's collective belief. Because at any particular point, if anyone disagrees with the price, he can come to the market either buy or sell to change the market price. So that's how a prediction market gets the prediction by collecting the information from individual market participants. Okay. okay, so a goal of the prediction market is twofold. So we want to elicit and aggregate information about some underlying event of interest. Elicit is achieved through offering a certain type of contract because the form of the contract matters. So with stocks in stock market, the only type of information I can possibly express as a trader is whether I believe the stock price will increase or decrease. And with different type of securities, you can imagine that we can allow traders to express different information. And the aggregation part comes into play really by thinking about the strategic behavior of traders and the rationality of traders. An economic agent, after observing the market price, should incorporate the information conveyed by the market price in his own beliefs. And that belief updating process is happening to aggregate the information of the traders in the market. Um, in this particular talk, I'm only going to focus on the goal of elicitation. So I'm focusing on how can we design mechanisms to support more expressive elicitation from the participants. So I'd like to give this slide just to show that in practice, prediction markets do work in a lot of uh, different real world settings. Uh, let me just give, uh, point to two particular examples. So HP, they use some internal prediction market trying to make forecast about their sales volume. And the market uh, based the, the classical traditional managerial predictions of six out of eight times. And there is tons of other like lab experiments and also field experiments showing that markets performs uh, at least as well as alternative methods, and in, my, uh, in most of the cases, actually better than alternative methods. <coughs> okay, <coughs> so, so so far I've talked about what is the prediction market, what is the goal of the prediction market, and we have some natural mechanism to operate a prediction market, because we do have our financial markets, and as you can tell that a prediction market is just a financial market, with a contract design uh, with an underlying event of interest in mind. So it's just a financial market. So we can just use our financial market mechanism to operate a prediction market. Um, our stock market uses what's called a continuous double auction. So the way that a continuous double auction works is the following. So given the contract, whether Argo going to win the, uh, the best picture award, 
uh, a continuous debt auction asks traders to submit buy or sell orders. And it will rank buy or sell orders here. So the buy orders is basically ranked in decreasing of the price because the the top one is the best buy order. Those are the traders who are willing to buy at a higher price. And the sell orders are ranking in um, increasing of the price. So the top one is the best sell order. Those are the people who are willing to sell at a lower price. And as you can see that currently the best buy order is lower than the best sell order for the prices. So nothing will happen at this point, but whenever uh, the top buy order is, has a price that, that is higher than the top sell order, a transaction will happen. So this mechanism is basically an order matching mechanism. So we match buy orders with sell orders. And the mechanism per se doesn't bear any risk. So the mechanism per se is just the matchmaker. It doesn't bear any risk. But we tend to ask ourselves, if we really want to use markets to elicit and aggregate information from individuals, do we have to use this type of continuous double auction mechanism that we've already have? So by the way, this mechanism was designed a long time ago for stock market. And at that time, we don't even have computers. So it's a really simple mechanism that people with hand and with a piece of paper can actually operate this mechanism and determine the transaction. Okay. But now we have a lot of technology. So we kind of want to ask the question, can we do better? And what do we mean by we want to do better? So if we want to think about how can we design mechanisms for getting information, we'd like to consider some design objectives. So the first one, I'd like to call it liquidity. So it's a very basic objective and being determined in the following sense. So I would like to say a market is liquid if a trader in the market can easily find a counterparty to trade with. So meaning if a trader comes to the market and want to review some information, he will be able to do that because he can find some other counterparty to trade with him such that information is reviewed. When we have a market that is illiquid, then even if some trader has information about the underlying event, he come to the market and he wouldn't be able to review his information. So that's going to be problematic for the purpose of information aggregation. So that's why we need liquidity. Okay. And the second consideration, so the second objective we have is that we want the market mechanism to have a bounded budget or bounded loss. So this is a natural restriction because if we want anyone to run a market, so that person probably want to have some guarantee of he's not going to lose everything in his life. So we really want to know that even if the market institution may lose the money, so we have to bump that possible loss. And if we look at these two objectives for the continuous double auction, so do you think the mechanism satisfy one or both of them? For your example, nobody could trade, right? So. Is continuous step auction satisfy the first objective? It doesn't seem like it. It doesn't seem like it, right? Because it's an outer matching mechanism. When we have a lot of traders in the market, that's not going to be a problem. But if we have few traders in the market, then finding a counterparty to trade with could be problematic. So the market could be illiquid. So that's about continuous double auction. And for the second objective, continuous double auction is always satisfied because the market mechanism doesn't take any risk. The only thing it does is to match buy and sell orders. So for continuous double auction, um, it doesn't satisfy the first objective, but it does satisfy the second one. Okay. So, so that's where the thinking of we want to design automated market maker mechanisms come into play. So now we have computers and we can actually design some mechanism such that every trader is trading with the mechanism per se. So instead for the mechanism to do the order matching, matching by orders well set with, with their orders, we hope that the traders can come to the market 
buy from the mechanism and sell to the mechanism. And we call such a mechanism automated market maker because it's basically the computer program sitting in our computers. So that's the background. Okay. And a popular automated market maker that kind of become the standard market maker mechanism for prediction market is Hansen's market scoring rule. So let me start with the implementation of that mechanism. So this is the automated market maker mechanism implemented by inkling markets. So in this market, as you can see that this particular contract is asking the question, uh, will the New England Patriots score more than 64 points in any of the remaining games of this year? And the contract pays off $100 if that event is true and $0 otherwise. So this is actually artificial money. So inkling market is not a real money market. Okay. And in order for a trader to trade in this market using a, uh, with the automated market maker, the trader can come and say that, okay, I want to buy 15 shares. And if the trader specifies that he wants to buy 15 shares, uh, the market will display the current price on the right and also display after this transaction, what will be the new price? And the trader will be charged some cost to make this transaction happen. So what the automated market maker does is, when a trader comes and saying that I want to buy a certain number of shares, the market maker tells the trader how much he needs to pay to buy this certain number of shares and what's the consequences for this purchase. Okay. So the transactions are happening with the market mechanism per se. Okay. Um, so Inkling's market is based on Hansen's automated market makers. So the way the automated market maker works at the, contract, uh, at the abstract level is we have two possible outcomes of the events. So one outcome is that Patriots actually win greater than 65 points. And the other possible outcome is Patrick's wins less than 64 points. Okay. And for these two possible outcomes, we just design two corresponding contracts. One contract pays up $1 if and only if one outcome happens. And the other contract pays up $1 if and only if the other outcome happens. So we have two contracts corresponding to two mutually exclusive and exhaustive outcome of this event. Okay. And what the market maker does is it offers these two contracts and traders can come to purchase these contracts and the market maker uses a cost of potential function trying to capture how much money the market maker has already collected so far in the market. So the cost of potential function here we represent it as CQ where Q is the current number of shares of the contract that the traders in collection has already purchased. So for example, if all traders sum together has already purchased 100 shares for the first contract and 10 shares for the second contract, then this Q vector is 110. So that's the outstanding share vector that the market maker trying to keep track of. Okay. And then Whenever a trader comes to purchase something or sell something, we can think about the trader wants to purchase the bundle, which is the vector R. So if I come and say that I want to buy 10 shares of outcome one and zero shares of outcome two, then that is my R vector, zero, ten, uh, 10, zero. Okay. And after this purchase, the outstanding share vector is going to be changed to Q plus R. And the market maker basically charges the difference of the cost function to the traders who wants to make this transaction. And R could be negative, that representing selling to the market maker. So this cost function basically will be used to determine how much a trader needs to pay the market institution to get some purchase, or how much the trader will get from the market institution if it's selling to the market maker. And prices, 
that's what we call the instantaneous price, which is basically the partial derivative of this cost function. And this price corresponds to the market prediction. This is like the probabilities that we have, we derive from the prediction markets. Is this clear so far? Okay. So that's in general how it works. And let me show you one example. It's called logarithmic market scoring rule. So this is the, the most popular market maker mechanism for prediction markets, also proposed by Robin Hansen. Um, so this is the cost function that is used by this market maker, and this is the price function. And the exact form of this cost function and price function are not important here. So really, don't focus on these two mathematical expressions here. Um, but let me show you a picture of how does it work. So I'm still thinking about two outcome markets, so two contracts. And suppose that I'm plotting the price for one contract. So nothing happened for the other contract. This is the price for one contract. Okay. So then this is the curve. Um, so when no shares has been purchased, the price for this contract is 0.5. The price for the other contract is also 0.5. So we start with a uniform distribution over the two possible outcomes. And if some trader comes to the market and saying that I want to buy 100 shares, then this shaded area is the amount of money that the trader needs to pay to the market maker. Because the trader essentially is buying according to this price curve, and the price changes continuously. So this shaded error is the total cost that the trader needs to pay to acquire this 100 shares of the securities. And as another trader comes in and saying that I want to buy 100 shares, then he needs to pay the shaded blue area. So that's the cost. So that's how the market maker works. Um, and let's just take a brief moment to think about whether such a market maker is reasonable. So first, we can say that the prices of the securities sum to one. So if I sum of the PI for all i's together, they equal to one. So this is actually really important because we have two contracts, each corresponding to one outcome. And these two outcomes are mutually exclusive and exhaustive, which meaning that in the future, one and only one outcome will happen. So if the prices of O contracts seems to be less than one, then as the trader, one thing I can safely do is I should just buy one share of each contract and I pay less than one dollar, and in the future, I get guaranteed one dollar. So even if I don't know which contract will pay off, I know that I have $1 in the future. So I make money without incur any risk. And if the prices of the security sum to be greater than one, I can do something similar by selling one share of each contract. So I get more than $1 right now, and in the future, I only need to pay $1 out. So I also have some positive guaranteed profit which means that whenever the prices of the securities doesn't sum to one, there's arbitrage opportunity in the market that some trader can exploit. Okay. And for logarithmic market scoring, we don't have that problem. The prices do sum to one. Okay. And the second thing to look at is that um, if I'm buying one contract, so assuming everything else is the same, if I keep buying one contract, the prices of that contract increases. So this is something that we do expect to get, right? Because if I think the current market price for this particular contract is too low, so I want to buy it, what's going to happen if after my purchase the price is even lower? So it seems that I can just keep buying and also make a lot of money. So we do expect that the prices will increase with the corresponding outstanding shares for the security. Then. Sorry, I missed with BNNR. Sorry? What is B and what is M? Oh, I didn't explain that. Let me, uh, I'll mention that briefly. Okay. Um, so 
So that's the second property. Okay. And the third property is that if we have a market maker, I mentioned that it's really important for someone who's running the market knows that he's not going to lose everything in his life. So even if he's, he may lose the money, he wants to know that how much in the worst case that he's going to lose, uh, he's going to lose in the market. Okay. So for logarithmic market garden rule, it has a nice property that is that the market maker's worst case loss is bounded by this particular number. And n here is the number of outcomes. So in this example, the number of outcomes equal to two. So n equal to two. And b actually is the liquidity parameter. So b, as you can see that, b also happens in the cost and price function. So b can be any positive number of the choice of the market maker. And different b only means the curvature of this price function. So if I have a larger B, then the prices will be flatter, will be something like this. And if I have a smaller B, the price function will be steeper. So approaches to one more quickly. So that's kind of a parameter that the market maker can adjust. And it also makes sense if you think about that, if the price changes slower, then in the worst case, the market maker may incur a higher amount of loss. So that's why the worst case loss is B log N. So this is the automated market maker mechanism for the specific case that called logarithmic market scoring rule. So let me try to avoid explaining why we have this name. Um, but it does come from some connection with a different area. But this is a popular market maker mechanism used for prediction market. So, so, so far, so good. We have an automated market maker mechanism um, that has bounded worst case loss. And when we have an automated market maker mechanism, traders can always trade with the market institution, so which means we do have liquidity. So the two design objectives that I have given before are both satisfied. So we should be happy now. But what if, OK, so they're both satisfied. But, but what, what if you have a large outcome space? So if you think about the setting of house racing with uncompeting candidate, so the automated market maker that we just talked about, the logarithmic market scoring rule, operate based on mutually exclusive and exhaustive outcomes. So we're defining one contract for one outcome. And when we have uncompeting candidates, the outcome space contains unfactorial possible permutations. So that's really large. And if we think about the presidential election case, if we're just are trying to predict which candidate is going to win the election, that's easy. But if you're trying to predict which candidate is going to win for which particular state and whether Obama will win both Florida and Ohio, so if you think about those type of predictions, then our outcome space is again really large. And if you think about options, which are based on stock prices, then we effectively have a continuous outcome space that's all possible realizations of future stock prices. So our outcome space is infinite. So when the outcome space is large, we still want to get information from participants. And very likely, participants have useful information for us to try to elicit and aggregate. But now, we just cannot naively run Hansen's market maker mechanism because Calculating prices becomes intractable. So for even very simple securities in this setting, it becomes sharply hard. Um, and also, humans are just very bad at assessing low probability events. If you're asking me something very unlikely to happen, it's very difficult for me to tell whether it's 1% chance or 0.1% of chance. So if we're really asking people to predicting uh, things related to the unfactorial number of possible outcomes. So how can they possibly give an accurate prediction? 
So that's something that we don't like. So we have our design objectives. So we want to get computational tractability. So that's very natural. If we want to have a practical mechanism, we want computational tractability. But at the same time, we also want to provide traders some level of expressiveness, meaning that when they have some information that they want to express in the market, they can come to the market and tell us what that information is, and the market can incorporate that information into market prices. So those are the two additional objectives that we try to design mechanisms for. I'd like to elaborate a little bit on expressiveness. So expressiveness has two meanings. So one is expressiveness in getting information. So there are certain things that people can express very well today. So for example, um, a Democrat will win the presidential election with a certain probability. So if I'm talking about this before the outcome of the election. Um, and no bird, uh, no bird flu outbreaks in the US before a certain date. So these are the type of the things that we can actually express very well in our today's market. But there are also certain things that we couldn't express very well in our today's market. So for example, um, if I want to say that a Democrat will win the election if he wins both Florida and Ohio. So that's not something that I can express in current market. And also, Microsoft stock price is going to be between $30 and $35 by the end of this year. So if I want to specify a particular range, I wouldn't be able to do that today. I can just buy the stocks, indicating that I believe future stock price will be higher than today's price, or I can sell it, indicating that I believe future price will be lower than today's price but I wouldn't be able to provide a precise prediction of saying that I believe future price will be in this particular range. So that's what I mean by expressiveness in getting information, is that we want to allow traders to express something more like the later part. So that if they have the information in that form, we hope that they will be able to express that in the market. And there's a second meaning of expressiveness, that means that we, we call this expressiveness in processing information. So let me just uh, give some example of today's market. So today's market an independent market. Just think about an example in house race tracking betting. So there are money pools that cut win, place, and show, which allow people to bet on which house will be the first, which house will be among the top two, and which one will be among the top three. Okay? And this is separate money pools. So what it means is that if I come and betting a particular house is going to win, that has nothing to do with its probability to be among the top two or its probability to be among the top three because the money pools are separated. So changing the probability for that particular candidate to win doesn't affect anything in the other two markets because the markets are independent. Well, that doesn't seem to be natural because those are logically dependent events. So there's some logical relationship between that. If a candidate is more likely to win, of course he's more likely to be among the top two positions or among the top three positions. Okay. But the current market doesn't deal with that. So what we want the market mechanism to do is that even if events are log even so given logically related events, we hope that the market mechanism can take care of the propagation of the information by preserving the logical dependencies of the event. And just to leave the traders to focusing on expressing their information, so they shouldn't focus on figure out whether there are arbitrage opportunities left on the table. They should just focus on expressing their information, and then the market mechanism can focus on propagating that information. That leads 
to a research question that my collaborators and I have been looking at. So this is the joint work with Jake Abernethy and Jen Watman Wang. Um, so the question that we're asking is, given a small set of securities over a very large or possible infinite state space or outcome space, can we design a consistent market that has bounded loss and can be operated efficiently? So I emphasize consistency here because we want to preserve the logical dependency of the markets. And we also emphasize that we're not thinking about allowing participants to express on everything. We're thinking about that we're given a relatively small set of securities of interest. So even if the outcome space is really large, it's very likely that the event that people are actually interested in is smaller than that. So we want to start from that point. Our starting point is to thinking about that we're given a set of securities and we're asked to design a market mechanism that will work for the set of securities we're given. Um, so we represent the set of securities as a menu table. So this is a natural representation. So what we're thinking about is that we have a really large number of states or outcomes, but we only have a relatively small set of securities. And these securities are basically defined according to their payoffs in the future. So if the future realized state is omega one, so outcome one, then you should be able to tell me what's the payoff of each of my security. So that's the only requirement that we have for having uh, for giving a set of security. So I need to know what is the payoff of the securities in any future state that can possibly be realized. And so the only thing we're requiring is that the security payoff is basically a computable function, an easily computable function. Okay. So this is what we mean by we're given a set of securities. Okay. And let me give two examples. So this is the house racing setting. We have n competing outcomes. So in this particular example, n equal to three. And the possible outcomes are possible permutations of the candidates. And we call this subset betting because we're given a set of security that allow people to bet on a particular candidate will finish at a particular position. So meaning I can bet candidate A will finish at position two. So by buying more than one security, I can also express my opinion on things like I believe candidate A will finish either at position one or position two. Or I believe A or B will finish at position one. So in this type of securities, as we can see that if for security A will finish at position one, it payoff is $1 for all outcomes that A indeed finishes at position one and $0 otherwise. So this is the subset betting security. So it's Sharpie hard if we want to use the standard logarithmic market scoring rule to uh, supporting trading of this type of security. And another example is the pair betting. So this is again for the permutation setting, but supposing people are interested in comparing the relative strengths of two candidates. So I may not know whether A will win or not, but I probably know that A is better than B, so A is likely to finish ahead of B. So for the contract of saying that A will finish ahead of B, it pays off $1 if that, that is indeed the case in the future outcome. So that's another example. So again, this is computationally hard if we just want to use the standard logarithmic market scoring rule mechanism. So we wouldn't be able to operate this contract. So what we try to do is that given the set of securities, we want to design some pricing algorithms such that given a history of transactions, whenever a trader comes to the market and saying that I want to buy some bundle of securities, the market maker should be able to code a price for that bundle of the securities. 
So that's what we want. At the really high level, what we want to design is the pricing algorithm to achieve that. But there are some innate challenges. So the question is that, what is the reasonable prices of the market? So when we were considering logarithmic market scoring rule, we had mutually exclusive and exhaustive outcomes. So we have some natural constraints that the sum of the prices should equal to one so that the market doesn't have arbitrage opportunities. But right now, what should be the constraints we put on prices? Okay. So if I think about parabetting, so I can come up with some constraints because if someone is betting on that I is going to finish ahead of G, and there's another contract for J is going to finish ahead of I, and this two becomes mutually exclusive and exhaustive, so I know that the sum of this price, uh, the sum of the prices for these two contracts should equal to one. So that seems to be easy. Um, but there are also other constraints. What if I have a contract saying that I is going to finish ahead of G, and J is going to finish ahead of K, and K is going to finish ahead of I. So I have three such contracts. So that forms a cycle. And at most two of them can be true. So which means that the sum of the prices should be less than or equal to two for me to not lose money. Okay. But what about other constraints? So it's really difficult for me to come up with all logical constraints to say what the prices should satisfy. And this is just for power betting, and that's still relatively intuitive. And if I'm given any manual of securities, it becomes impossible for me to come up with the constraints in this fashion. Okay. So the approach that we took is an axiomatic approach. So we try to think about, if I want to design a mechanism, let me start with the properties that I want the mechanism to have. So not thinking about whether we can achieve that, but let me just try to define the properties and say whether we can characterize all market mechanisms that satisfy these properties. So the first property we have is pass independent. So it's very simple. It's basically saying that if you want to buy 10 shares, how much you need to pay for buying 10 shares should equal to how much you need to pay if you split that 10 shares into three shares and seven shares and buy them independently in a consecutive fashion. So no matter how you achieve the final holding of 10 shares, you should pay exactly the same amount. So that's the path independent. And this alone will give us into, so will bring us back to the framework of cost potential function. This basically says that okay, the market maker has to use a cost function, and that is a function of the outstanding shares of the contract. So that sounds familiar. And so a second property that we consider is that we want to have a price. We want to have existence. Uh, we, we want the existence of some instantaneous price of the security because the market prices are our predictions. And that's also easy. In mathematical terms, this is just a saying that, okay, the cost function must be continuous and differentiable, and its gradient gives us the instantaneous price. So I want to emphasize that we have a cost function, and the price is basically the ingredient of the cost function. Okay. And then the next property that we want is information incorporation, so which we think is also very natural. The purchase of a bundle of security R should never cause the prices of R to drop, meaning that it can stay there, it can increase, the prices cannot decrease. And if we require that, mathematically, the requirement is the cost of function has to be convex. So that's the type of thing we really like to say. We want to start from the properties we want and derive the mathematical conditions we need for our market mechanism. Okay, so I'm not done yet. So the third one is no arbitrage. So basically saying that no matter what happens, 
purchasing some bond of shares cannot give some guaranteed profit for the trader no matter what happens in the future. Meaning that I don't allow free money. Okay. And if that's the case, combining all these properties together, we get a mathematical condition. And let me just explain it a little bit. So, so you can safely drop the closure. That really doesn't matter, because that's just about mathematical accuracy. Um, but what the left-hand side says is that, remember that the gradient of the cost function is the market prices. So the left-hand side basically saying that all allowable prices has to be contained in the convex hull of the security payoff. So what the convex hull of the security payoffs mean? So remember that we're given a menu of securities with rows at the stays and columns at the securities. So this convex hull is basically the convex hull of those row vectors. Okay. So this condition saying that allowable prices that doesn't create arbitrage opportunity must be contained in the convex hull of the security payoffs. Okay. And our last property is the expressiveness. So a trader who has a belief must always be able to buy or sell the securities in the market to reveal that belief, because we're trying to get the information. And if we require this, we get the opposite of the previous condition, which basically says that, OK, the convex how of the security payoffs must be contained in the allowable prices set. So if we combine this together, we get a characterization. If we want any market mechanism that satisfy all the desirable properties that I have just introduced, then this market maker must use a convex cost function such that the allowable prices region is exactly equal to the convex hull of the security payoff. Okay. So that solves the problem of what should be the constraints we put on the security prices. And when we have mutually exclusive outcomes, so the convex hull is basically the probability simplex. So this is consistent with the logarithmic market scaring rule that we have talked before. Okay. And, but how can we design a cost function? So we don't really know. Uh, the characterization is not constructive. But we can make use of fact from convex analysis so this is the fact from a convex analysis. Let me just explain that and match that to the setting that we need for designing a market. So if I have a convex function C that is dif differentiable, then it can be written in this form. So this is called the conjugate duality form. But this, as you can see, that the rest, right hand side is the optimization problem, where a particular R function which is called the conjugate function of, uh, of C. And this R function has to be strictly convex. So meaning that any convex function can be written in this form. So just this result is not helpful, because you tell me that I need a convex function, and you just write the convex function in a different form. That doesn't seem to be helpful right now. But the following result will make it helpful. So if we solve this optimization problem, the optimal solution actually is the gradient of the cost function. So remember that we want the gradient of the cost function to be prices in the market. So which means that if we design a cost function in this way, by solving the optimization problem, we get market prices. We get the instantaneous prices. So to generate a market with a convex cost function, we just need to choose a appropriate R function and define the corresponding domain. So now this all becomes really easy. This, uh, how, how this um, equation here relates to the Legend transformation transformation statistical mechanics? It's exactly the same, right? Yeah, it, so this expression happens like appears a lot in various different settings. 
I know that it appears a lot in variational inference in those type of settings where machine learning people look at a lot. And this is kind of the online convex optimization that also machine learning people are interested in too. So um, I'm not going to talk about it. We actually also show that the market mechanism has a one-to-one -one mapping uh, with a class of online learning algorithm. So, so I think it's not surprising that you look at this formula and this is very familiar. The C function that you have from before is the free energy. It's, it's uh, B log something. Uh -huh. okay. Then R is entropy. Yeah, exactly. So I'm going to talk about it right now. So, so now just think about our, our regional market maker. So we have mutually exclusive and exhaustive outcomes. So those should fit into this framework too uh, because what we only need to choose is that the price domain here should be the probability simplex because that's the convex how. And this R function can be any strictly convex function. And for the logarithmic market scoring rule, this particular function is a negative entropy. Okay. So you can check that this is correct. But now if we want to design a cost function for our set of given securities that doesn't correspond to mutually exclusive and exhaustive outcomes, the only thing we need to change is that here we replace the convex half the security payoffs. And the R, we can pick any strictly convex function. Okay. So I'd like to just at one comment is that I haven't mentioned the worst case loss, but actually the worst case loss of the market maker relates to this conjugate function R2. So everything can be bounded in terms of the R. So we do have a market maker that has bounded worst case loss. Given this framework, we can run some markets in a computationally efficient way. So we do get all four properties that we desire to have. We have liquidity, bounded budget, computationally tractability, not always, but for sometimes, and expressiveness. And I want to emphasize that I only talk about the elicitation part of designing a market mechanism. So the elicitation part doesn't really considering the strategic behavior of traders at all. There are other interesting design criteria too. So for example, we want to incentivize people to review their information honestly, we want to get truthfulness. There's also a lot of work along that line. And also, um, so researchers from CMU, they look at things at how can we change the liquidity over time? So in the sense of like for logarithmic market scoring rule, instead of having a fixed B, how can we change that over time? As there are more traders coming into the market, we want the market to be deeper. So that's some other interesting criteria to consider. Um, let me conclude by thanks my wonderful collaborators. So, this, so the technical part of this talk is coming from uh, the paper listed here. And that's a joint work with Jake Abernese, who's currently at Penn, and Jen Watman Wong, who's at UCLA and Microsoft Research New York. And both of them are wonderful. And I believe Jake is on job market too. Thanks a lot. Any questions? More? At a very high level, I like your goal of letting people express whatever they want. For example, that the stock price will be between 30 and 35. But if you stick to that to the extreme, it seems like you may make your job much harder than it needs to be. But if someone wants to express, I believe it will be between 30.02 and 34.98, they might be almost as happy to yeah. express a probability between 30 and 35. Um, is that a, a, a knob you can control? Or something you put yeah, on? so uh, that's a great question because there isn't any limitation in terms of offering expressive news, right? So if you're thinking about uh, participants can have crazy information about the underlying events, allowing them to express every possible info pieces of information that appears to be crazy. So the expressiveness comes into a play um, just to the degree of what is the set of securities that you're interested in getting information for. So even for the work that I just talked about, we're starting with a set of securities, and we just assume that someone else give, 
the set of securities to us is not our decision. But limiting that set of security already limit the expressiveness. So we're not achieving full expressiveness. We just hope that we can push the boundary by getting more expressiveness and still get some computational tractability and more information aggregation. So it is an optimization problem. In your example, you have the, the fixed set of securities and essentially logical implication allows you to tell something. What happens if you, if market players, you know, do want to play the, the correlation? You've said there's no arbitrage. Is that, is that captured already in your framework? Or yeah. would, you, uh, would you need something else to somebody to say that these prices, you know, that, that there's correlations between pairs of these? Yeah, pairs? that's a great question. So our framework captures the, uh, the very basic arbitrage opportunity. So meaning that like if you run the market in our framework, it doesn't exist any arbitrage opportunity uh, for a trader who doesn't have any information to make money. But if you think about some traders who just have better information, so he knows something for sure, then he can make money in this setting. So we're not like get rid of that part, which seems to be a reasonable thing for a trader who has better information to make more money in the market because that's the type of incentive we're trying to provide using the market mechanism. Okay, let's thank Elaine again. Yeah.